Don't you ever let anybody tell you anything but the truth. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 246. And today, we're joined by Sensei Nick Nicholson. If you're new to the show, I want to thank you for tuning in. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. And you can check out everything that we make, all the other websites that we produce, everything from martialartscalendar.com to martialartsmemes.com. And the best place to start to find all the things that we do is whistlekick.com. You can find the show notes for this or any of the other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. No hyphens or any funny ways to spell everything. We just do it straight up, nice and easy. We want to make things simple for you. There's at least one thing going on that's simple in your life, right? It's this show. Hopefully you've got some other simplicity, some other elegance beyond your martial arts to look at and say, hey, things don't have to be overly complicated, do they? Hey, maybe that's a subject we need to tackle on a Thursday show. Complication and complexity in the martial arts. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We are here for Sensei Nick Nicholson. Now, our guest is a former Marine, and he's the founder of the Family Kenpo Academy. He was a tough kid growing up, and it took a while before he started his formal training in the martial arts. His story, as with every story we bring you, is interesting, inspiring, and it showcases how martial arts changed his life allowing him to become the person he is today. So, without further ado, let's welcome him to the show. Sensei Nicholson, welcome to Whistlekick Commercial Arts Radio. Ah, well, thank you for having me. Well, I appreciate you being here. I'm looking forward to this. You are part of this kind of uh, Kempo wave we have coming in on on the heels of Mr. Scott Bolin, who listeners may remember has already been on the show and has introduced us to a number of folks, including you, and there's more on the way. And But of course, we're not just going to talk about Kempo. We're not going to talk about things that are so limited. We're going to talk about <laughs> martial arts, aren't we? Because it's... Absolutely, yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of all the same when you really get down to it. Sure. We're all sure. doing the same weird, silly stuff, wearing <laughs> angry white pajamas, to, to borrow the title of that book. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's a... Uh... It's uh, it's going to be good. Um, Scott Scott's a, a great guy, and uh, there's a lot of great great martial artists that uh, that I've had the, the pleasure of meeting and, and training with. So I, I look forward to the future with them also. Cool. And if we were to go all the way back to your first days as a martial artist, you know, give us a little bit of context, your origin story, if you will. How'd you well, get How'd you get started? Okay. Well, um, if you consider like, uh, in my backyard, uh, doing side, uh, flying sidekicks with, with the, uh, Saturday morning, um, Kung Fu series, that that would be it. (laughs) Um, but, uh, my, my official start was when, uh, I was in the Marine Corps and I was 20 years old. Uh, I was in California at the time. Uh, I was based out of Camp Pendleton and I was, I believe I was going to uh, uh, a grocery store or something like that. I was looking for something, and I saw a sign that said Sagnam Taekwondo College. And I'm like, Taekwondo College? What the heck is that? So uh, I walked in and uh, spoke with uh, Sagnam. He he was the uh, Korean Olympic trainer and a very, very cool guy. Um, Both of his sons were there. And I was like, man, those guys are amazing. Um, but uh, I start, that's when I started uh, my martial arts career. I, I got up to Blue Belt, and then I got transferred to, uh, I was actually in uh, Iwakuni, Japan. And I was looking all over for a dojo. I just was in the wrong spot. I couldn't find it. And, of course, you know, I can't read kanji. Um, and everybody I would talk to, they'd say, oh, no, no, no. And uh, So, but... But yeah, that's how that's how I got started. Okay. So obviously, you, you kind of alluded to it that there was some interest very early on. Oh but yeah. But there was quite. I, I'm going to guess, you know, a solid eight, ten, twelve years in between flying sidekicks in the backyard and your start at Taekwondo. Yeah. So yeah. I guess the question is why. You know, we don't have a lot of folks on the show who have that initial interest and wait so long. I'm yeah. curious if there's a reason. Well, um, I believe it was uh, my parents. 
uh, I would believe um, I was uh, I was not the best of children. <laughs> um, and uh, I would get into a, to a lot of fights. Um, and I, I believe that that's why uh, they they didn't want me to get into that because they saw the uh, the side of it that was the kicking and the punching and things like that. But they didn't see the discipline side. Um, I think that would have helped, but that's, that's probably the reason, um, I, I can't, I can't speak for them, but sure. I'm sure that's what they, I'm sure that's what they would say. Sure. So here you are, you're, you, you find Taekwondo and you make it to blue belt. Yes. Was it what you expected? I gotta say it, it was, and it wasn't, especially what I, what I know now, but at, at the time it was, uh, something totally brand new to me, you know, everybody that walks in somewhere, you know, they're very hesitant to, uh, to actually, you know, get immersed in it. And, and I was no, no, no different. Um, uh, I think it was after I, I did a tournament at the California, uh, state, uh, tournament and I took uh, second place in, in Kata and, um, my, they, they wanted me to go to the uh, international, but I couldn't because of the Marine Corps. So that ended that one. Um, but it, it was more than what I expected, on the other hand, with uh, the training and things like that. So, yeah, it, it was it was it was a very good experience. And I truly enjoyed uh, my time that I had there. When you say it was more than what you expected in terms of training, what do you mean? Well, they had they had um, people from other um, other disciplines uh, that would come, and they started there. So I even even though that person was a you know a shodan or uh, in uh, in karate, they would come and they would start as like a white belt in taekwondo, and so it was you. you ha- me starting out as a white belt that had never had any formal martial arts training. You know, I mean, I had, I had Marine Corps, uh, the Marine combat training, but, um, that was before the Marine Corps adopted the Marine Corps, uh, the martial arts program. Um, so the training was uh, limited, uh, to, to what we, we were doing in the Marine Corps. So that was my first official martial arts training, uh, at the Taekwondo and it was, um, an experience to have to try and keep up or spar with the guys that were already seasoned. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it was a very great learning. I'm, I'm a big proponent of positive and negative feedback. That's why I like being the Uki a lot of the times, because I want to make sure that it works. You know, I want to make sure what you're teaching me works. And everything that I've had done on me works, I can tell you. <laughs> awesome. Now, if we take a step back, you know, we, we just spent some time digging into kind of the, the early piece. We, we got a little focus. But if we were to take a, a couple of big steps back, and I was ask, asking you to reflect on your time in the martial arts. And I said, what's your favorite story? Mm. What would your favorite story be? Oh, well, I can, I can tell you this. So, um, I, I've trained for seven years at, um, the self-defense studio in Crestwood. They actually were the ones who, uh, showed me from white belt to my showdown through them, uh, Kempo, Tracy's Kempo. And we have recently uh we have another um instructor now so i was at uh, roger green's warrior weekend uh two years ago and there is a, a gentleman that, now all of these people that I'm, I'm i'm talking about i i highly respect them um they have they have given me a lot of of things to use when i teach and things like that and by that i mean it could be negative of what not to do and what to do. Um, there's a G- Jimmy Stewart is uh, one of Roger Green's black belts. And 
I was doing some working out and things like that at the warrior weekend, hands on and things like that. And Jimmy Stewart turns to, to Ted, uh, and says, uh, who is that guy? And Ted says, well, that's uh, Nick. He's from Chicago. And Jeremy said, man, he's got really good tempo. Now, I didn't hear this. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. It's Ted Sumner from the San Jose tempo. Ted Sumner and Henry Childers, I believe you might be having an interview with him. I'm not sure. Um, I can neither confirm nor deny. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Henry came up to me at, you know, Henry was standing by Ted and, and Stuart. So Henry came out to me later on and said, Hey, you know, Jimmy said this about you. I'm like, wow, because Jimmy's an older man, um, older martial artist. And I really respect him for this. The the guy is amazingly fast. I, I saw him working out one time and I was like, Holy crap. I cannot believe a guy and, and nothing against, you know, being older because I'm not a spring chicken myself. But it, it amazed me how fast he was moving and the power he was generating in such a short distance. So for him to say that I had really good tempo, I, I, I was I was I was floored. Um, he later came up to me and he said, hey, you know, uh, you have really good tempo. You need to thank your instructors. And I said, I absolutely will. So that's that's my Kempo story. That's that's something that I that I hold very uh, near to me um, because it, it not only reflects me, uh, but it reflects my instructors and it reflects other people that that have contributed. Because I, I can't just say it was my instructors. I get a lot of uh, uh, extra training from like Ted Sumner and Henry Childers and all the seminars that I go to, you know, I try to take something from everybody. And it, so far it's, it's worked out to my benefit. And that's my attitude when I go to seminars, you know, and just try to try to empty your cup. You know, we have that, that great cliche right. in the martial arts and, and I see so often folks will come in and, and they seem to go to seminars for the opposite reason. You know, they're, they're trying to, to prove what they know. And I'm thinking, you know, it's just an expensive way to have your ego dashed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. One one of the things that, um, speaking of ego, nobody in the martial arts has an ego. No, no not at all. Not at all. No. Absolutely. Um, me being no different. Um, so I also, I, right right now, uh, I have, I've always been fascinated with uh, the katana and, you know, the sword in general. So one of the things that uh, I think helps with ego is starting another martial arts and starting at white belt. So right now I take, um, Iaido, um, at, uh, Shinjin Kai in, uh, Chicago. It, it, it's, it's very humbling. You know, you, you reach a certain point in your martial arts career where you're like, yes, you know, I can teach this. I can do this. I'm able to help people, but to be put in that position of needing that help more, from somebody else, it's, it's uh, an incredible uh, placement of one's ego. And I, 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 I honestly think that's needed because we do have a lot of ego. We do. We yeah. Do, do, you, do you think that makes you a better teacher to be able to step back and, and put on a white belt again? I, I think so. I think it, it, it really does. Um, it puts you back in that mindset of being that white belt. What, what what are they experiencing? You know, we've my, myself and, and my fiance Barrett Cyber. Um, she's she's also uh, she teaches also, and she's she's the kid whisperer. I, I got to tell you, every time a little kid would come into the studio, I'd be like, "How you doing?" And they'd start crying, <laughs> and I go, oh, "That's your that's your child right there." Um, but you know, uh, it's it's very. Um, we've taught a lot of people. And I, I, it, it just puts you back in that mindset of, hey, what were you feeling? I, I think when, as martial artists, as we, we go along so long that um, we kind of forget that. And we kind of go, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we were there. But to be put back in that position, I think, is a tremendous help to, like I said, your ego and teaching people, for sure. Mm, I agree. Absolutely. And it's something that I think 
I think if we had some kind of unspoken rule about, you know, you hit a certain level, a certain amount of time, you know, we just, we take that belt off you and you got to go start over somewhere else. Right. Right. You know, yeah. I, I think there, I think we, I think that ego would, would fade a bit because there's sure. nothing more humbling than, you know, being a, a 20, 30 year veteran of a striking art and hopping mm-hmm. into, you know, judo yes. or something and realizing, wow. I'm terrible <laughs> exactly. at this. Absolutely. Yes, ab- absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, I'm not saying that I've been along around for forever, but you know, I, I have been alive, but this year will be 44 years for me. And, uh, I've done a lot in my life. I've been all over the world and I, I'm, I'm a pretty good, you know, read on people. Um, and I've experienced a lot of people and the way people act and things like that. And, you know, when, when I, when I hear somebody tell me, that Kempo is the only way, you know, I start going, come on, you know, why, why don't we, why don't we take a step back? Show me, show me how you're going to get up off the ground if somebody tackles you. And then you're told, well, you just don't go to the ground. Well, how does that happen? <laughs> teach me, please teach me. Because, you know, it, it, anything can happen. And, and I think if you take, bits and pieces from different people, different arts, you are more well-rounded martial artists. And I, I know some people have a problem with that where, you know, they, they think that it's only one way, but, you know, the Marine in me for always being uh, prepared for stuff, you know, I, I want to know the, the thirst for knowledge is there. So, but yeah. One of my favorite things about that, that the whole notion that there's only one way, you know, that, that this way is the right way. The irony is that at least based on the reading that I've done of the founders of those styles is they believed the exact opposite. Right. <laughs> they collected the things from everything else that they saw and said, this is what works best for me and I'm going to teach it. Right. Exactly. Um, one, one of the things Stuart Gavin said to me, well, Again, I, the guy's the guy's going to be here in Chicago. He's going to be with us for a week. Uh, he's actually going to be staying at my house. So um, he he once said to me because he he does judo, uh, jujitsu, or jujits. Um, he does iaido, kempo, but he has his kempo with an M instead of an N, like us. Um, one of the things that he said was, "I take different martial arts." to try and learn what my Kempo will work on and what, I, what, what it won't work on. And then I incorporate the stuff that they, they teach to make my Kempo better. Now that right there, that is something to think about. Because if, if, you, if you think about it that way, Kempo is fantastic. I, um, I work for a, a train, uh, a passenger train service here in Chicago. And uh, I've actually, you know, after all my, my, trying to stop uh, conflicts and things like that. I, I, I have had to use it on the train and it's very fast and dynamic and it's very, um, I guess, controlling, mm. you know, and um, I, I, I know it works, but I also know that other things make it better. So it's just not all about Kempo, even though Kempo is the, I, I, in my opinion, one of the best arts out there. Because it, it Kempo has uh, Kung Fu, Judo, it has Jiu Jitsu in there. It has all that stuff. It's already in there. But if you take all these other martial artists and, and, and learn from them, you can make those things better. So, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you have time for, for things that are non martial in your life outside of training and teaching and uh, fighting bad guys on trains? Are there, <laughs> <laughs> do you have hobbies? Um, I absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, uh, well, I don't know. I guess it all relates to, to the martial arts. Martial arts is, is, is such a big part of my life. Um, I do woodworking, but a lot of the woodworking is geared towards the martial arts. Um, I like make belt racks and things like that for people. Um, there is, uh, I, I do silk screening and those are usually, Kempo related <laughs> silk screens. <laughs> so everything, I guess everything. I, 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 yeah, I guess so. But you know, I mean, I, I, I really love my, my, I have uh, three kids, 
uh, Ryan, who's 18, Max, who's 14, and Alexis, who is actually my da- my uh, my daughter, but not really my daughter. I've raised her since she was four. She's my fiance's daughter, so I consider her my child. Um, she's actually probably the one that's most like 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 me out of everybody, which is crazy. Um, but uh, I, I enjoy uh, hanging out with them. They're they're good kids, and uh, of course spending time with my my lovely fiance so. now you mentioned that she trains do your children train uh my daughter does my older son he did and my um my middle son he, he has no interest in it so okay. he just does his own thing which is cool I, I show him some things some things he wants to see some things he's like okay that's great is that hard so, is that hard no no, no. Um, no. i i um because I, I made sure that the other two kids know that uh, I'm not going to be here one day. So you all got to look out for each other. And if, if Max doesn't want to train, it's perfectly fine. But now it's up to you guys. Mm-hmm. I kind of put the blame on them so they can <laughs> put, put some screws to them. There you go. Hey, you know, you really need to learn this. So, but they're, they're good. It, it doesn't bother me. Um, it, I, I I regret that my older son didn't keep going with it because he was the, the kid's fantastic. Um, and here goes the ego again. <laughs> I wish I had half the talent that my kids had, you know, flexibility and things like that. You know, the Marine Corps, it really does a, a toll on your body. At age 40, I had my left hip redone. It was the best thing I did because I can still kick and things like that. But, you know, as you get older, you know, the flexibility goes. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, but that's the ego part again. So, <laughs> well, you know, I, I think having a little bit of an ego is, is healthy. It's important. If, if we sure. spend all of our time working on making these things better and we continue to look at ourselves and say, Oh, we're terrible. We're crap. Yeah. Then, you know, it kind of loses some of the motivation to move forward. I think the, Oh, sure. Oh, I, I will never say that I'm crap. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the Marine Corps, uh, I was the guide and, uh, that was the guy who holds the flag and all that stuff. Well, my senior drill instructor came out to me and he goes, guide, he goes, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you ever let anybody tell you anything but the truth. He said, always speak up. But if you know you're wrong, keep your mouth shut. So I, uh, I live by those rules uh, even to this day. You know, as we're, as we're talking, we've kind of been hitting on good stuff. And unless you are the most fortunate person on earth, you've had stuff in your life that wasn't fortunate. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering if you might tell us about a time and how your martial arts helped you through that time. Well, um... It was not a very good uh, leaving our old uh, instructors. They were of the mindset that they, they, they think that loyalty should be put above anything. And by that, I mean, if they treat you a certain way, who cares? You should still be loyal to them. If they say something to you that you don't like, well, you shouldn't you know, correct them. Well, we're not them, those type of people to, um, be treated in such a way. So, um, it was very hard hard to, to leave them, uh, because we were conflicted, you know, loyalty. Did we do something wrong? And then when we, we sat down and we said, you know what, we didn't do anything wrong. Um, we were able to go, all right, well, we're done. And, uh, they didn't like it, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, we started teaching and it's actually not, I I guess in a way it is the martial arts that, that helped, but it was more of the people we were teaching. You know, it would have been very easy for us to go, all right, we're done. We're not, we're not going to teach anymore. We're just going to step away. But all the friends that we've made, the students that we, that, we've actually impacted their lives for the better. That's what makes it good. 
And, and like I said, I, we take good things and bad things from people. Our instructors uh, absolutely taught us how to be good tempo martial artists, taught us how to be great instructors, um, but they also taught us bad things. And we didn't like those bad things enough to believe. So, and it's unfortunate because uh, we really like them. You know, we consider them family. And hence our name. Family Kempo Academy, and uh, it's uh, it's we have uh, some some partners that we we teach with it, and it's Jeff Sigler and Erica Russin. And uh, from the moment we uh, myself, Barrett, and Erica, we all started at pretty much the same time. Um, and Jeff started probably a year before us. And man, when we were on, we were on a mat at the studio. Uh, cause we all trained at the same place. When we were on that mat, we were teaching group class, man, you had parents going up to our instructor going, we want those guys to teach our classes. And, you know, here we are, um, blue belts or green belts. And, you know, they're saying that they want us. So we have a very good chemistry and that's why we decided to, uh, come up with our own um, studio, not our own system, because you know the Tracy system is is fantastic, and there's a lot of of information and things like that. Um, but that's why we called it Family Kempo Academy. Um, the four of us actually left because of of things that happened, and uh, yeah. So I guess I guess martial arts did uh, did help uh, help help us through it because it was I'm. I, I've I've been used to being treated by people bad. You know, my fiance, she took it I think the hardest because she's never been treated but like the way she was treated, and um, I feel bad. I feel bad. I should have saw it sooner, but oh well, you know. And there's two sides to every story. Oh, so. but anyway, on to happier things. I just want to ask a, a little bit, you know, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dig. No, no. But I'm just curious, as you look back, you know, hindsight's 2020. Mm -hmm. Did your expectations, your standards change, or did their conduct change? I always have very high standards for myself. Um, You know, I don't know. I, I would... I would like to say that it was a combination of both. Um, because again, they, they have taught me so much. Um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have, have known them. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I keep finding out things from other people as I meet more and more people from, uh, the past that have, you know, trained with them. I, I keep hearing more and more things and I, I just don't dig it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but again, I, I wouldn't be here today without them. Right. So you're certainly uh, not the first to come on the show and and talk about this in in some way. And and I think it's a more common occurrence that someone progresses through the martial arts and sees that this person that they they've held up in such high regard right. really can have this the very same failings that any other person can. And, right. you know, we, we don't have to go into the, the specifics of, of my opinions or your opinions on why that happens, but it seems that if nothing else, when we have that realization that this person that we've looked up to for so long is human and fallible, it almost seems like it's worse. Because yeah. they should be better. Because we look at training and we look at all the good things and we, you know, we talk about respect and we talk about all the wonderful things. I mean, you look at any typical um, marketing materials for a children's martial arts class and then you find out that the person who's running that program and has been doing so for however many years has forgotten some of those fundamentals that they teach. Sure. It's hard. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I can hear it in your voice that it's hard talking about it a little. Yeah. You know, it's bringing yeah, up some emotion. I, 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 I really don't, I don't, I don't talk about it with a lot of people. Um, there are, uh, a core group of people that I, that I 
speak with about it. Um, uh, I, I, you know, just because, you know, it's, it's, it's very, uh, I off, off putting, you know, I, I think back and I go, well, what, how is this impacting the students that I've, I've taught, I've promoted, um, how does it impact them? I, I don't really so much care about myself um, for the simple fact that I, I, I know myself and I know that what I've attained. And you can't take that away from me. But I have a very strong constitution. And, you know, if you have somebody and somebody that ha has trained, let, let's say Barrett, Barrett trained uh, one kid for three and a half years. And it was, let's say that she left and now this kid's thinking, well, where did, where did she go? Well, am I not good enough? I mean, that's just, that's horrible. That, that's absolutely horrible to think of. And, you know, I'm sure Barrett thinks about it a lot. She, she brings up past students from that studio and she's like, man, she goes, I wonder how they're doing. You know, so I, I know it affects her. But again, without them, I would not be here. Right. So, and, and it's not, it's not a, it's not a bashing on my, my instructors because, you know, I really value everything that they've taught me. Sure. You know, I, I don't there think anybody, different ways to go. Yeah. I don't think anybody listening is going to hear what you're saying and think that you're, you're trashing them in any way. No, no. You know, it's, it's clear that you had, differences and differences are okay and it it sounds right. like you made the best of them that you've yeah. learned from them that your school is more in line with what you want you and, right. and, and your fiance and your partners with right. the way you want to teach and really right. i mean that that's what we should all have we all should all have the ability to present our information to to teach our students in the way that resonates best for us Sure. Sure. And, you know, we've been told by, by people that there are no bonds. It's only, it's only, uh, tempo, it, you know, there, there are no bonds and, and you go and you sit back and you think to yourself, no bonds. Are, are you kidding me? They're, they're, in my opinion, they are trusting you to teach them things that will help them in life, you know, in their family and to keep them safe, you know, cause it's, it's not only just, especially me being a Marine, not only just, um, martial arts, like the martial arts side, like tempo, it's being aware of your surroundings, you know, not having to use your martial arts, you know, that's, that's a big part of it. Um, I, I heard somebody say, you know, you, you, you spend 15 years learning uh, a system and you spend your whole lifetime trying not to use it. Mm, that, that. That's a, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good uh, way of thinking about it. You know, uh, like I said, I, I, I used to be a bad kid. I used to fight all the time. Um, not only did martial arts help, the Marine Corps helped. Um, and when I get a kid in and the, you know, the mom's like, yeah, he needs something or she needs something. Okay. I used to be just like him. I know I get it. Um, but yeah, that it, it's our responsibility as, uh, instructors to make sure that not only are the things that we were taught instilled in them, but to make sure that they go out into the community and be good, good citizens. You know, that, that's our, that, that would be the worst thing to have somebody come to you and say, you train this kid or this guy. And he went out and he beat the crap out of a bunch of people that it shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. you no, know, of course, you know, you get people that are, but you know, for the most part, that's our responsibility. No such thing as a bad student, bad teacher. It's a karate kid line, if I remember. 
absolutely. Yeah, that it is. Especially with uh, like, what, what color belt are you? Uh, Levi's or whatever it is. What did he say? I can't remember. Can't yeah. remember. Belt is good for holding up pants. That's it. Right. Right. That's why we don't wear, uh, we don't wear stripes on our belts. You don't? No. Okay. Uh, uh, we have kanji. Uh, one side says uh, Kempo Karate. The other side is uh, Spirit of the Tiger and of the Dragon. And uh, there's no stripes on there. Um, and that, that comes from my former uh, instructors. And it's a, another good thing that I talk, I took from them. You're, once you're, uh, you, you achieve black belt, your learning starts all over again. And um, it doesn't matter what rank you are. You know, um, that black belt has, has a very, very uh, vast meaning of and uh, why would you want to put that's that's the ego side of it again? Yeah. How many stripes you have? Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I say it another way. Change. Yeah, What's they that? might. Well, I, I kind of look at it, it, it if if you would be able if you know if you have six stripes on your belt, and this is this is not a criticism, but if you have mm-hmm. six stripes on your belt, we better know even when that belt's off. In the sure. way you conduct yourself, and the way you train, and the way you teach, and who you are as a yeah. person. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We've heard that's a, a good, lot about... A... Sorry? No, no, go ahead. go ahead. We heard a lot about your former instructors, and mm-hmm. how much of an impact yeah. they had on you. Sure. Who else has been really influential on your martial arts? Ah. Uh, uh, well... Ted Sumner, Henry Childers, Stuart Gavin, uh, Roger Green, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, there, is, there is a guy, Roger Lee. Uh, he lives in Kentucky. He is uh, one of Henry Childers' um, guys. Um, and he does this, you know, I'm not sure if you ever, Bruce Lee did like a, uh, a one-inch punch. Yeah. Well, Roger does a touch punch. And the first time he ever did it on me, he's like, hold that book. And it was a phone book. And uh, he did it at Last Man Standing in Dallas uh, with Nick Chamberlain. He put on for Mr. Tracy. Mm. And uh, I I had the video on Facebook. And um, it's where it's similar to the to the one inch punch, except his fingertips are touching and the way he moves now. At the time, I was 215. I weigh 200 now. But I'm, I'm no small guy by any, any stretch of the imagination. And he rocked me from that. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Hang on a second. So I, you know, I got real low in a good horse stance. I held that book. And he did it again. And I was like, are you? He said, are you ready? I said, yes. And he hit it. And I was like, are you kidding me? And he, you know, uh, Rogers, uh, you know, thin guy, uh, six foot, um, older gentleman. And I'm like, that's, that's what people don't expect from somebody like Roger, you know, that misconception about people. And that was an eye opening thing too, for me, uh, that this man can just rock me and, and, he hit me with, with that, that power. And I was like, Holy cow, how did he do that? Well then, uh, in this year's gathering of Eagles in uh, Dallas that Nick Chamberlain put on, uh, with the Tracy's, uh, I was Rogers Uki for the whole seminar. And, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, that that's a good point to bring up to him. Roger, Roger Lee. That guy is fantastic. So yeah, what, what I, did you take from that? Can you do that yourself? Yeah, you learned. Yeah, yeah. I, what, I, what's the I have. I, what it is is it's as with all karate, it comes from the hips, and it's just that slightly. You do a slight drop in your stance with a little twist, and it's unbelievable the the power that you generate, and 
uh, you know, it, it took me all seminar, but I'm like, all right, boom, boom. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he's a great instructor. Um, him, <laughs> yeah, everybody's like, no, no, he didn't do that. You let him do that to you. I'm like, okay, let him do it to you. Um, and you know, everybody was, you know, you know, when they know that it's not crap, when they put that little, after he does it and they rock back and they, they put that little smirk on their face, like, man, how'd that guy do that to me? That's when you know that it was, it's, it's good stuff. And that's that training. The training is just fantastic. You know, the, the gathering of Eagles, um, all these seminars that people put on, um, it's just a fantastic way to not only network, but to learn other things, you know, uh, Henry, Henry Childers, that, that guy's fantastic. He's, he, uh, he does a lot of small circle jujitsu and he does Kempo and things like that. And what I found is it's the, the guys that you don't expect, you know, Henry's a very, uh, unassuming person. I guess would be the right words. And, uh, but he's, his technique is so right on that. I'm like, Oh, okay. That works too. So, but yeah, I love seminars. I I think it's one of the most fun elements of martial arts training Mm -hmm. to, to go and kind of have these intense immersions into other things that people do. And and even instructors that you train with the moment you get them into that kind of a format, with other people, they become different. You know, you right. learn things in a different way, and it's just yeah. Stuart Stuart Gavin at the at uh, at the Last Man Standing last year. Um, I was his uki for three of his seminars. So, uh, I learn a lot by being the uki. How things work, the proper type of pressure you need to put on things. And, um, that guy, Stuart, <laughs> if you've never been to one of his seminars, the, he, the time isn't long enough. You're like, where did the, where'd the time go? You have so much fun. He, he's such a fun mm. instructor. He, he, you know, he, he's, First of all, his accent, which he's probably going to beat me when he gets here, but his <laughs> accent is fantastic, especially when he's saying stuff. And then he'll look at you and go, what do you say it for this? And I'll go, yeah, it's this. Oh, okay. Um, but it, 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 the people that, that we train with, their technique is, is, is spot on. And, you know, Stuart is no different. And I think one of the advantages that, all of his people that come over from Scotland, all fantastic. And um, they, in Scotland, they can't carry handguns. They can't carry guns. They can't have weapons. They have to use tempo. They have to use hand-to-hand stuff because they don't have anything else. Yeah, they can use a stick and a knife or whatever, but they have to use it no matter what. And I think that's what gives them an an advantage sometimes over, you know, a lot of people, you know, from other countries that allow weapons, you know, anybody, anybody can pull out a gun. Well, okay. Now defend against a gun and you don't have one, um, or a knife or a stick or whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, Stuart, Stuart, the the practical application of the techniques and things like that, I, I I enjoy. But yeah, you've mentioned a lot of great people, people that clearly have had a strong impact in not just your martial arts development, but it sounds like your personal development. Oh yeah. But if you had For the sure. opportunity to to add one more to the list, somebody you haven't trained with, somebody alive or dead, who would that be? Oh. I would, I would say, you, you know, Bob White, um, I see a lot of, uh, you know, 
Facebook is an amazing tool. You know, Bob White was actually in the Karate Kid movie. He was one of the judges, the referees in the in the fights. And he's his studio has been there for 40, 40 years, I, th- I think it is. Um, the way he he moves and things like that, and the way he teaches, you know, because through the magic of Facebook, some of the things you can see, and you know, Bob White would be one, um, and I think the the main guy would have to be James Matosi, mm. um, because he's the one who brought Kempo to uh, Hawaii for. Uh, Mr. Parker. And then, um, it spread from there, you know, and then there's mixed, there's mixed feelings about James Matosi about his accomplishments and, um, things like that. But yeah, I I think I would like to train with him. Mm -hmm. That old Oak style, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly an influential figure in Kempo and if anyone's new to the show, you might not know. We, we did an episode, a profile episode on Matosi, and I, I, I apologize. I don't remember the episode number. You know, here, here we are into the 240s, 250s. They're not all stuck in my head by number anymore. But we'll right. link that in the show notes. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll have a link in there make it nice and easy for you. Right, right. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, they're very... A uh, bunch of different opinions on him. And, uh, but yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Or, at, or, uh, uh, professor Chow, yeah. you know, one of his students, it'd be fantastic. I, it's the training, you know, the, the more I could get, the better. And, uh, when I first started, I, you know, I, I felt like a little kid. We have one technique where it's a, it's a hip toss. And, you know, it's a right punch from the side. You do uh, parry brush block and boom. And then you, you do a hip toss. And I, I was, I remember like giggling like a little kid going, do it again. Do it again to me. And, you know, it, it's that training. It's that, all right, this is fun. The, the, it's, it's when it doesn't become fun that I think people have a problem with. That it's, you know, uh, you hear people all the time. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Great. You never see him. <laughs> and that, and that's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but then it makes you look, did I do my job enough? Did I make it fun enough for them? Did I give them enough? You know, so there's a lot of things that, that um, you take from people that stay and they go. So, uh, yeah. And, and I, I think, I think one of the things uh, that would be a a huge honor, if if I take somebody from a white belt to a black belt and I try and teach them everything and I instill in them things that I was taught, how to teach people, um, and somebody wants them over me, I don't think I would take offense to that for the simple fact is I would say, man, I did such a good job. They want that person and not me where you have other people, you know, whether you're a fifth, a 10th, a a ninth, whatever you are that would take offense to that. Well, why do you want them? They're only a first degree black belt instead of being, Hey, you know, I did such a good job with them, you know, and I think that's, that, I think that's what we all have to get out of people that we train. We're teaching the next generation to basically be us uh, or a better version of us. You know, it's just, it's just like your kids, I think. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what more can you want for as a martial arts instructor than to pass on your knowledge and have it improve, have the students that you train exceed your capacity right isn't that the definition of of success as a martial arts instructor that they transcended what you knew and what you were 
That's right. That's kind of how I see it. A- absolutely, yeah. But, you know, th- there's people out there that don't think that. Yes. And uh, it's, it's, it's sad. And, and you know, I, I don't know if it's, it's because it's, it is a business also that they're afraid that they're going to lose people because, you know, you won't train them because they won't. I, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I honestly don't. But, um, but I, I, I think that that's something I will take away from anybody who ever says that they're a better instructor than, you know, anybody who says that, I don't know about that. Um, it's the people, you know, it's the people that, that I think should choose their, their instructor. And then the instructor will either say yes or no. Yeah. You mentioned earlier a bit about Mm -hmm. competition and, Mm. but uh, we haven't talked about it since. Is that a big part of your, your life or was it ever? Um, when I was in Taekwondo, we, we used to have competitions all the time. And, um, (laughs) <laughs> there was a point where it was okay you could punch and, and kick and things like that it, it, I was at a tournament one time and a guy went to kick me and he was doing a roundhouse kick and you know I dropped into a really low uh, stance and ducked my head well they were like you can't do that and I'm like what are you talking about why can't I do that? Well, because you ducked down. I go, but I didn't duck. Like there, there was a difference. Like I went way back into like a, a really low bow stance and the kick went over my head. And then I came back up, bam, and I hit him. And they said, I couldn't do that because I was ducking under the kick. And I'm like, well, I really don't want to get kicked. So <laughs> it happened twice. So that competition it, it it it's just my interpretation that it's become more of a tag oop i got you you know you get anything from you know i understand incidental contact happens it's it's a it's a uh it's a sparring match you're going to get punched you're going to get hit but to be disqualified because you hit somebody. And I know they're saying control, but if you're going in to backfist somebody to the temple, you know, in their headgear, which is legal and they move, you know, they expect you to, I don't know. I, I, Mike McNamara is a great example. Um, I'm not sure if you know who he is. He's, that guy is fantastic. He is, uh, I believe he runs the sports karate museum right now, or is one of the contributors. He has the Illinois martial arts hall of fame okay. that he does in Illinois. And, uh, he would, he would take gold or silver at every police and fire Olympics. He was a, a police officer in the town I grew up in. And he would like he would have broken ribs and and uh, fingers and things like that. And that's the stuff that really you, you've seen the old films, of, you know, of, uh, you know, no chest protectors, no, oh, yeah. no helmets and things like that. That to me is the epitome of a, of a competition, you know. Um, hitting somebody in a pad really doesn't doesn't show that you you know your stuff. It just means you're faster and you know you can tap somebody. Right. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's why I think a lot of people. Uh, I have not seen a lot of tournaments in my area that that we're in. Um, and I don't know if that's the reason or if it's just the lack of interest or I'm not, I don't know. I have a feeling 
that you're a martial arts movie guy. Yes. Am I right? Okay. I just, yes. I had a gut Absolutely. feeling, you know, pretty much everybody's into them at least a little bit. Sure. Mm-hmm. But something tells me you're, you're more than a little bit. Oh yeah. Um, I love the, the Ip Man movies. With, uh, uh, who was Bruce Lee's teacher, Ip Man. And, uh, I, I like those. Um, I, I like everything from the old Kung Fu movies. Like I said, when, when I used to watch them on Saturday morning and go out in the backyard and try and duplicate those, those things, I would never be able to get up into those trees. I just don't know how, how they ever flew that out. So if you yeah. figure it out, let me know. Yeah. How about actors? Um, uh, well, I like, uh, uh, Jai White. I like the guys that like, uh, actually train like uh who amazed me was um keanu reeves the 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 guy i was like holy cow he he actually trains with the guys for for his movies Uh, like john wick and things like that and he was in that movie tai chi tai chi master and uh that guy amazed me um jason statham he he does uh karate i watch a couple of his tournaments and uh, I, I like the guys who, you know, aren't just trained by choreographers. Right. Um, yeah. And you can tell the difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'd be like, that doesn't work. That won't work. Um, my, my fiance, Barrett, she, 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 we were watching, um, she was watching the show Arrow. Um, and she's like, did you see that Campo move? <laughs> like, what was it? And uh, yeah, it was an overhead knife attack, and there was a deflecting block, and then the guy like shoved the the knife right into his leg. I go, well, that's our technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was very cool. She, yeah, she she's always like pointing this out, pointing this out, pointing that out. So yeah, yeah, nice, nice. It's fun to have a significant other who not only tolerates watching the movies with you, but will will enjoy oh, yeah. watching the martial arts stuff. Oh, Whether yeah. or not they yeah. train, because I know yeah. I know plenty, and you know, and it, I'm not just I'm not being specific to one gender or the other. I know I know plenty of plenty of folks who are not blessed with partners that will right. watch oh, martial yeah. arts content with them. You're you're going there again? Well, how many times you go a week? <laughs> you know, we we uh, well, gosh, when we started, uh, the the whole reason we started Kempo, I, I got to get to that. My, my older son was very he wouldn't look people in the eye and things like that and he was very timid and uh i didn't feel that i would do a good job with that at first because you know a new dad um and uh i think the marine corps too much of the marine corps would have came out um so I, I needed to find something. So we were driving past uh, on Cicero here in, in Chicago, and I saw a Kempo sign. And when I saw Kempo, Jeff Speakman. Right. That's what I thought of. Yeah. And I go, okay. So I go, all right. And, you know, gosh, we drove by it probably for a year and a half. And finally, I was like, you know what? We're going to stop in. So I stopped in. Uh, and I originally sat down with Becky. Uh, it was Barrett and I, and then Becky was there and, uh, she scheduled us a time to come back with, with Ryan, our son and, and just go, uh, and talk about it. So it was originally just Ryan. Then Greg's like, why don't you take it too? I'm like, okay, I'll go on the mat with you. Um, then Barrett wanted to join. Then Alexis wanted to join. So we all started pretty much at the same time. Um, Ryan stopped going. He was a orange belt. Um, we kept going. Uh, so Alexis is now a, a third brown. And I wouldn't mess with the little girl. <laughs> little girl. I still think of her little girl. She's going to be 15 in January. But yeah, uh, but yeah, it, it's good to know that the 
the women in my life can take care of themselves. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but that's all the reason why we got started at Kempo. The family that trains together, right? I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty Absolutely. important, powerful. I mean, there's, there's some yeah, very yeah. there's some good stuff in there. And just from my observation, yeah. families that are training tend to stick around longer because it, you know, you have that built in yeah. support system when one person, right. you know, wants to fade away. The other two, three say, no, come on, we're going. This is what we do as right. a family. Yeah. We, we had a, a, quite a few families uh, and let me see how many we had uh, probably like six, four person families that would come. So it was, it was, uh, it was good to, and it, teaching, that was the other obstacle. How do you teach those people with different skill levels and things like that? Um, but that, you know, you work that stuff out. It's crazy. I started teaching when I was a orange belt because I started teaching my son and Alexis. We would get our lesson and then we would teach uh, the kids. And uh, I was really fortunate coming up in the place that I came up in the martial arts because I would make mistakes. The other black belts on the mat would never say anything to me in the lesson. After the lesson was done, like if I took on another student, a white belt, after the lesson was done, they would come up to me and go, that's great, but how about you try this? And I'd go, oh, you know what? I was showing that. So we came up in a really good studio, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the people around us, the support system was fantastic. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, we were very, like I said, very fortunate to have, have the people around us that we did to, to better our instruction and things like that. Nice. As you look to the future, what's, what's going on? Are you, you know, are you a goal driven person or are there things you're striving for? Are you trying to oh, hold yeah. steady? I mean, what's what's going on as we look well, over the horizon? Um, right now, um, we we our our new instructor is Todd Tomko, and he's in Ohio. So we have to, you know, go out there. We're, we're in Illinois, and it's a six hour drive. So um, we're going to go out there train for the, for the day. Then the next day we're going to have the tournament. Um, so we're, we're going to start, we're going to try and get out there at least once a month. Um, because we want to start working on our, our sand down. Um, so, you know, the, the, the goal is to, of course, always progress. Um, we want to, uh, I actually want, we're going to be moving to Indiana and we want to buy some land and build our studio on there. I, you know, there's a, I, I want a, a building that is simply dedicated to the studio. That's it. Um, just when you go like, uh, when you have a, a dojo in a, in a strip mall or something like that, you or you always have constraints on what you can have. Like, uh, a, a muck, uh, muck Johns are, if you hang it on a wall, um, your, your neighbors are going to go, you know, why, why are you making so much noise? Or if you have a Maki Wara board, you can't drill it into the concrete. You can't, you know, dig it into the concrete and do it like you should. Um, so we want to have this, stu- uh, 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 a studio out in Indiana on our property where we can customize it. We can have people come out and train. And I take that from Roger Green. Roger Green um, uh, lives in Oklahoma, and he puts on Warrior Weekend every year. And he, he's got I, I, a bunch of acres, and he has a studio out there. So not only does he have a studio on his property, you can train outside. You know, there's huge sections where you can train in. You know, we train inside, we train outside, and it's fantastic. So I, uh, I'm going to try to emulate his property a little bit, um, because I just think it's it's fantastic. Um, 
there was so at, at the Warrior Weekend last year, you had Ted Sumner and Jefferson Davis. Um, uh, I think Dan Kennedy was there. there. There was a bunch of different martial artists. We all went out to breakfast. All of the older uh, generation martial artists were at one end of the table. And all the younger generation, like me, uh, Jeff, uh, a guy, Jane, Gene Sepulveda, uh, the crazy Russian guy. He's great, though. Um, Vance Murakami, Bill Dalton. All of, all of us younger generation were sitting at one end of the table. And I look down and I see all of them and they're all talking, all the older guys. I should say seasoned, not even older, just seasoned guys. And I'm looking and I'm going, man. And I turned to Gene and I said, Gene, you see that? He goes, yeah, what about it? And I said, that's going to be us someday. You know, that's going to be us. So we're going to have to have, you know, because Roger Green, although we would love him to be around forever, he's not going to be. It's just a fact of life. But we need to have stuff where people can train. You know, it, it's up to us as the next generation to try and fill their shoes. As big as they are, you know, it's, it's up to us to try and fill their shoes and try and be as good or if not better than them um, for the next generation. Because that's how it's, it's, the whole thing is going to happen, have to be continue to go. Um, so the plans in the future are to try and, um, Al Tracy, um, who's, you know, the, the founder of the Tracy system, uh, he put out a, a memo. Well, there, there, we did a seniors meeting, um, and studio owners meeting at the gathering of Eagles. Um, and one of the things that he wants is the system to go on. And, you know, in, in my opinion, all of us who teach and take the Tracy system, that's what we want. Because it is such a, it's such a unique system. It, it encompasses so many things um, that uh, we should really pass it on to the next generation. It's, I, I, I believe that's important. And, and again, we got to try and fill those seasoned guy shoes. So the other generation that comes up after us, fills our shoes and so on and so on and so on. Then I, I think if you don't, that's how, it get, how things get lost. You know, th things get lost in the martial arts. One of the reasons we have this show. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, thank you, by the way, for, for having this, oh, you know, it's a great outlet for people and the martial arts calendar. That's absolutely fantastic. Try it. Try it. Maybe, maybe that'll have to be the thing that we, we plug in this episode. We usually plug something in the intro and the outro for each episode. Yeah. But martial arts yeah, com. It's free to use and free to post go. to. That's it. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. How can people get a hold of you? People are listening. If they're traveling through your area, if they want to drop in or somebody just sure. says, you know, I, I loved hearing what you said and I want to reach out and say thank you. Well, um, we have uh, a couple different, we're on all of the social media platforms, you know, Facebook and S Twitter, Skype, Instagram, all of it. Um, we have a website. It's called family tempo.com. Um, you can, what we do is on that website, it'll, it, it basically tells you about us and how we started, where we came from, um, what we teach upcoming things. Like there's like a calendar section on there. If we're involved in a, in a, a seminar or if it's just somebody else's, like there was a, uh, uh, there's a, a benefit on October 28th that's put on by an Aikido studio. We have a Kempo page and we, we encourage P, uh, a Kempo Facebook page and we encourage people to put on their seminars and, and their training and things like that, because that's why we're here. You know, we're here for, to, to spread the martial arts throughout uh, the world. 
And this, this Aikido studio, uh, it's called a center for the martial arts. It's in Worth, Illinois. They're doing a benefit. There, there was a, stu- there's a studio, an Aikido studio in, um, Puerto Rico that was just devastated by the hurricane. You know, they've been teaching for, uh, in the local community for like 10 years and their studio studio was just decimated. So they're having a, this benefit. And, uh, I think Scott put it on, on one of, one of the things I can't remember what he put it on, but, um, those are the types of things that, that need to get out there. So, so that'll be on the, the, the Kempo uh, website. Uh, you can go to family Kempo Academy, Facebook, um, Eastside uh, Kempo dot com or Eastside Kempo, and then we have Crestwood uh, Family Kempo Academy on Facebook. So um, our phone number, if you'd like to train, is seven zero eight nine four two nine five nine four. Anytime you can call, leave a message. You know, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Sensei Nicholson is definitely a well-rounded individual not only in martial arts, but in life. He's a dedicated family man, both inside the academy and at home. His journey to the martial arts has given him the tools to face life and not only survive, but thrive. Thank you, Sensei Nicholson, for sharing your story today. If you want to check out the show notes with photos, links, and everything else from today's conversation, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all the other past episodes there, and you can find everything else that we do, including our wonderful product offerings, at whistlekick.com. I thank you for tuning in today. I hope you'll share this or maybe another episode with somebody else. Please help us grow so we can continue to attract the very best martial artists in the world and have them share their stories with all of us. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.